So how can I know that God is my provider if I'm never in need? Yeah. How can I know he's my comforter if I'm never in pain? But the enemy wants to come in. He wants that pain to be what he deceives us to believe is God doesn't love you. And so it creates all these distortions that just completely shut us down mm -hmm. and hinder the, the quality of life that Jesus has made available to us. Well, Ken, welcome to Praise on TBN. I'm really excited for you specifically to be here to talk about some of these questions because some of the most pressing questions we get from the YouTube audience is in the area of mental health, emotional health, relational health, spiritual health, and really wherever people are on the journey, they just kind of want handrails and tools to get further along. One of the common questions we get is, why do I feel stuck? Why do I feel stuck emotionally and spiritually? Why don't I feel closer to the Lord? I've been a Christian for X amount of years. I should be further along than I am. So there's there's the question to you. How can we help people get unstuck? Yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack here. Well, the first thing I would want people to understand is me too. <laughs> and right. me too. Right? <laughs> yeah. This is a universal condition. Yes. And to just realize that the spiritual growth that we're going to be unpacking and talking about is a lifelong journey. Yeah. It's not something we get zapped with at the moment of salvation. It's not something we ever actually get zapped with because it's a process. Yeah. And the Lord is the Lord has created the opportunity for us to have an intimate relationship with the true and living God. Mm -hmm. And so all of the change and the growth comes out of the context of, of relationship. that relationship. Yes. And I think that's I think Christina that's why he allows certain things in our lives that he that he makes this a process instead of just zapping us because if we're zapped there's no relationship. Uh, you can attribute that process to everything in understanding suffering and why is this happening in my life because God is saying cuz I want to be there for you. Mm -hmm. I want to be something for you in that moment that I can't be for you in any other mm. way. So God has given us this desire to pursue him. And he's given us then the free will to choose whether or not we're going to pursue that desire, how, mm. how we're going to go after that. It's, I, I liken it to it's an invitation. It's an invitation to a life and a quality of life that is only possible with me. That's mm. Jesus' invitation in John 10, 10 to this abundant life. I like that. I like the quality of life part because I think, I think sometimes we can feel like it was supposed to be different than this or better than this. I mean, something that's very real and current is disillusionment with the church. It's, it's not just why don't I look more like I should or why am I not further along, but why doesn't the church sometimes look like Jesus? Yeah. Um, and one of the things you kind of unpack is that there's there's one particular key thing that really blocks us from that growth. And I also think from that that closeness sometimes with the Lord. And do you want to talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah. Well, I was a pastor for 25 years. And so I've worked with a lot of people that have expressed the very same sentiments that you're alluding to. And as I have thought about this and even experienced it in my own life, I really think one of the key reasons why we get stuck is unresolved emotional pain. Hmm. And that's not usually something we attribute to spiritual growth. We tend to kind of compartmentalize things. We keep our spiritual life over here and then our, our emotional life here and then our yeah. physical life here, as opposed to God created us as holistic beings where everything- They all inform one another. Exactly. Yeah. And so when we start looking at the growth process through that lens, that there's there's multiple things going on here. It's not just something that's segregated over here. It starts to inform the process in a very different way. Specifically, it's not just about reading my Bible and having good theology that is going to make me spiritual hmm. and grow spiritually. As important as that is... Yeah. Yeah. It's not just praying harder. It's yeah. not just serving and being in small group and being generous with my finances. Those are all important yeah. things. But those aren't the things that are going to produce character formation into the image of Christ. Because I think that is the primary goal of the Christian life. 
I think that is what discipleship is all about. It is, it is becoming more like Jesus. Paul talks about this uh, a couple of different places. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, we are being transformed into his likeness, which comes from the Father who is the Spirit. So there's a process here that Paul's alluding to that I believe begins at the moment of salvation and is ongoing throughout the rest of our life. We never get, we'll never fully be actualized in that. But I do think we can make progress, that hmm. we can become more loving, more uh, kinder. Hmm. We can become more gentle, more patient, uh, that these fruits of the Spirit, if you will, yeah. can become more and more evident in us. In us. Yeah. And we can be making progress, but we're never going to get to that. No, fullness, this side of eternity. This side yeah. of eternity. But I like what you said because it happens, it happens in relationship with the Lord and in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Can you talk about what's the Holy Spirit's part? What's our part? How do we partner with the Holy Spirit in that? I think one of the reasons I think that's a really good and important question is because when you start talking about our part yeah. in this, I think people can get nervous hmm. and appropriately so because we know that we're saved by grace through faith, that it's not of works. So then what are we talking about yeah. here? What we're not talking about is any kind of works-oriented yeah. approach to our salvation. What we are talking about is that in order to grow spiritually, God has called us into this relationship, this partnership with the Holy Spirit. Now, He's the primary agent of change. No growth happens apart from, apart him. from him. And we can't grow ourselves. But our part in that, maybe maybe a, a farming analogy might help here. Uh, the farmer cannot make the crop grow. But what he can do, he can plow the Good soil, soil yeah. plant the seed, water yeah. the seed, fertilize the seed, and then it grows. In a similar way, that's our part. We don't grow ourselves, but what we do is we sit down with our Bibles and read the Word. And then we let the Spirit work through that. Hmm. He's not going to read it for us. The effort on our part is it's to actually, sit down and read yes. it. Yes. Yeah. And so, and that does take effort. Yeah. It's not something that is easy to do. We never have time, right? So we have to prioritize. We have to put it in our schedule. And you can say the same thing about prayer, going to church, getting in a small group, whatever it is. There's effort involved. But what you're clarifying is is that it's the internal that produces the external. A lot of times. I'll just say at church, we're focused sometimes on the external, on doing the things, but we're not aware of what's going on in here. Going back to what you said about one of the main hindrances being that, uh, that undealt with emotional pain, that that can really cause a barrier and a breakage there. And I'm just wondering, well, I, I know because we've talked before and I read your book, but I know you've had experiences where this this became uh, very evident to you. Do you mind sharing one of those? Yeah, well, our experiences linger in the heart and unresolved emotional pain doesn't just go away over time. Maybe you've heard that phrase, time heals all wounds. Yeah, I, I don't agree with you. It's a yeah. lie. <laughs> time alone heals nothing. Yes. And so it's something that has to be processed. And if we don't, it stays in those deep recesses of the heart and will come out in a current situation. It's funny because I think some things can fester over time. Absolutely. I mean, they it's, don't, it's like yeah. an infection. Yes, yeah. it's exactly right. So I could actually talk about a lot of things because I'm a constant work in progress. But one of the things that comes to mind that uh, we've actually talked a little bit about is when I was a little boy, I had a very uh, difficult experience with the dark that created a lot of fear. And as an adult... I never could really get around why am I uncomfortable in the dark. So 12 years ago, I started working at a ranch in Montana during the summers. We do these five-day retreats called the Trinity Encounter. And I usually get up there a day before just to help out, just yeah. to get things ready and such. And there's three houses on the ranch that, that host our guests. We usually have 15 or 20 men. And then when the women do theirs, they have 15 or 20 women. And my house is the one that's the farthest away from of everything. Course. It's the <laughs> deepest, darkest part of the forest. And, you know, it looks like that right there, the, <laughs> the backdrop that we have. And uh, it's really uncomfortable. Hmm. And so I started noticing, and I even said this to my wife, Susan, that I'm really starting to feel anxious. Like it's two or three days before I'm getting ready to fly up to Montana and be there for a week. Hmm. And I couldn't understand why. It's not yeah. like I'm nervous. I've been doing this for years. I love doing this. I love the guys that I get to be with. 
And she was the one that actually helped me connect huh. the dots. And she said, well, honey, you remember that experience you had when you were a little boy? That is playing itself out today as a fear of the dark as an adult. Now, to be honest, I'm embarrassed to share that with everybody who's going to be watching this, right? As I was then, but it's important for all of us to know we all have broken parts to us. We are all works in progress. We are all on the same journey. And that's one of the ways, Christina, that I think we can come alongside of each other. Yeah. And so when I first shared this to the group of guys that I was with, I was really nervous about doing that because I didn't want them to make fun of me. I didn't want them to think I'm some kind of, you know, yeah. immature person. And I didn't get any of that. I, I think our greatest fears uh, are rejection, abandonment, criticism, or judgment. Yeah. And that, that's, that's often why we don't share. And so we have this stuff that's in our, that's in these deep places of our heart that we may not even be aware of. Hmm. That kind of bust out like a beach ball underwater in certain situations, they get triggered. Yeah. And as an adult, it would be very easy for me to condemn this emotion of feeling afraid of the dark and just like, you know, suck it up, buttercup. What's the deal here, right? What is going on? And that would, you know, somewhat dismiss it, yeah. but it doesn't resolve it. It's super important. Like what happens in the heart is critical because like we've talked about from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks that we are called to guard our heart with all diligence for from it flows the wellspring of life. So it's almost like the heart is, is the, is the center of who we are as people and what happens in there, what's allowed to fester in there, or I guess conversely, what's allowed to heal in there. I think to your point is going to make the difference between living a more abundant life, being further along in that spiritual growth journey or being stuck. God created us, it goes back to the garden, to live in intimate relationship with each other and mm. with him. Whenever there is shame, fear, fear of condemnation of rejection, we are going to shut down and yeah. we're gonna protect Put ourselves. Put the walls up. And we go through life, I think a lot of us, Christina, and even in different seasons that we go through life like this. <laughs> it's that yeah. I want connection, but I'm afraid you're going to hurt me. Yeah. Because the only way that we can actually experience the love from another person is to let the force feel yeah. down. Vulnerability is the doorway to intimacy. I was going to say, even even for you to acknowledge with your wife, Susan, what, what is it that's being triggered in me? That takes a lot of, I think it's brave and it takes a lot of vulnerability because you might not like what you find or you might be embarrassed by what you yes. find. But if you can, it's interesting because it's like, if you can just get past that healing it can be on the other side of that. Yes. And what I hear you saying is that you have to identify what those triggers are, what is happening in your heart. But then secondarily, you need to process that with a trusted person uh, who I, I think in your book or in previous conversations, you've mentioned that someone who's going to treat that with grace and with empathy mm -hmm. and, uh, and then also process it with the Lord directly. It is essential that we do both. And what's really important is to recognize that the Lord is not going to kick the door down mm -hmm. in order to extract this out of the deep place of your heart and just rip it up yeah. to the surface. He's not, he doesn't work that way. Yeah. In Psalm 139, David invites the Lord, search me, O God, and mm -hmm. know my heart. And I think we need to invite the Lord to do that. Because, and then he will do that, but he's always going to do it in a way that is gracious and is gentle because there may be people that are listening to this or watching this and they're thinking, well, I don't know what it is that's in there. Well, that is normal because yeah. only God knows the things that are in yeah. the deep places of our heart. Yeah. And so we have to ask him to reveal those. Yeah. And then he does in his time, in his way, mm -hmm. and he identifies the exact things. He doesn't just open the whole Pandora's box right. because that would overwhelm us. It, <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like break. He, he just, he, when I have sensed God doing that in my heart, it's been, it's typically one thing at a time. Like he knows where you're at, what you can handle. Yeah. And it is, he's so gracious in the way he does that. I also just have the verse that it's his goodness and his kindness that lead us to repentance. And that, that changing of our mind, it just, it's pretty powerful. But, but, what you're alluding to though is really important is that we have, to, we have to operate out of a, a accurate understanding of who God is, of who God is. Yeah. 
Because any distortions we have is going to prevent us from moving toward him. Huh. A.W. Tozer said that your concept of God is the most important, important thing. thing about you. Yes. I remember, yeah. Yes. And so if I'm afraid that God is just watching me to make a mistake so he can throw a lightning bolt at me to get me to straighten right. up my behavior, that's going to create a very different yeah. perspective of God. Yeah. And I am not going to move toward him. Yeah. I'm going to move away from him. So part of the process Part of the healing process, I think, too, is also identifying what are my distortions yeah. about God mm -hmm. that need to be uh, corrected yeah. through an accurate biblical understanding mm -hmm. of God. Well, and I don't want to take up too much time, but I can share that that has been, that's been my story. Mm -hmm. When I was young, I lost my mom to cancer, and I let my very limited understanding of him at the time and what I had experienced really dictate to me who I thought God was. And it was that he either he wasn't real, he wasn't good, he didn't care, you know, all those things. And it wasn't until I really allowed the Lord through bringing me another amazing mom and through other loving believers and just through through learning about him and experiencing him, what began to happen was who he said he was began to shape my view of him. And those distorted thoughts started to get corrected. And now it's funny because I feel like one of the chief um, purposes of my life is to defend the character of God. Mm -hmm. And it's the exact thing that got so twisted for me when I was so young. Um, so I just feel like that's so crucial because you're right, you're not gonna turn to him. If you don't think he cares or he loves you or he's great, going to be gracious to you or he's going to embrace you and that he desires to heal and he desires to walk with you. You know, Christina, our painful life experiences can create such a barrier to the healing process. Mm. And what you went through and what you experienced in identifying that and working through a correct understanding of God is equally courageous, <laughs> but is also a very common process <laughs> because all of us have pain. Yeah. And I learned a number of years ago, a different way of thinking about suffering <laughs> that has really helped me. It's really changed my whole perspective and, and even some of my theology in that regard. And again, it comes back to this relationship and God's heart is to have relationship with yeah. us. Jesus demonstrated that on the cross and he's made that available to us. And I think it makes him sad when we run from him because we, we believe something different about yeah. him. But here's what I've discovered. One of the reasons I think God doesn't just snap his fingers and bring us to instant maturity or deliver us from whatever yeah, painful experience yeah. it's been, it is, is because he wants to be something for us in that experience that he can't be for us otherwise. So how can I know that God is my provider hmm. if I'm never in need? Yeah. How can I know he's my comforter if I'm never in pain? So at least in this life, it seems like one of the ways that we get to know the character and nature of God is through contrast. Hmm. It won't always be that way. But the enemy wants to come in. He wants that pain to be what he deceives us to believe is God doesn't love you or that you're not good enough or that there's something wrong with you. And so it creates all these distortions that just completely shut us down hmm. and hinder the the quality of life yeah. that Jesus has made available to mm -hmm. us. Ugh, I love that. Um, I wonder if, I mean, we've covered a lot. We've talked about that emotional pain can be a massive barrier. Again, I think not just to that, that spiritual growth process, but to closeness with God because of our distorted thinking caused by that. And then the real way forward, it sounds like, is identifying what that is. It's uh, bringing it into the light in the context of loving relationships with other people and with the Lord himself. And I just wonder if you would mind praying for people who feel like 
This clip is for me. I resonate with everything they're saying. I feel stuck, or I, feel, I felt stuck back here when I was five or when I was 10 or when I was 15, and I want it to get unearthed, and I want to be able to move forward. I don't want to be stuck anymore. Do you mind praying for people? Yeah, let's do that. Lord Jesus, we want to experience the fullness of life that you have made available for us. And we recognize that there's a lot of things that keep us stuck. And one of those is a misunderstanding of who you are. And so Lord, I pray that you would give us a, a biblically clear picture hmm. of who you are. And that you would give us the courage to actually trust it. And to let the truth of your word inform the truth of our experience that is oftentimes distorted. Lord, would you reveal yourself to us as the loving and compassionate, as the gracious God, as the kind and patient God that you are. And Lord, may you give us the courage to actually believe it yes. and to start internalizing your love in a way that enables us to experience a different quality of life that you have referred to as abundant. Lord, that's our desire. And I pray this, Lord, for myself, for Christina, and I pray that, Lord, for those that are going to hear this message. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.